Well, we are in the book of Matthew together. We're in Matthew chapter 10. Let's open up there, Matthew chapter 10. We're going to finish the book of Matthew today. Uh, not the book, the chapter 10. We're going to finish chapter 10. Boy, that'd be a doozy. We're going to finish chapter 10, which we've been in for a couple weeks. The title of this message is Scary Jesus. And you'll see why when we read the text. We're looking at verses 32 through 42, but we'll just read through the end of verse 39 for now. I am reading and preaching from the NIV. Jesus is speaking here, and he says, starting in Matthew 10, 32, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on earth. Did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This too is God's word. Let's pray. Jesus, if need be, forgive me for the title of my sermon. You know I don't mean to dishonor your name or cast dispersion on who you are. But honestly, these words before us are hard words. Hard to fully comprehend and hard to live into. We would confess that they are that for us. They're hard. I know they're, they're hard for me because there are many idols in my heart. You're calling us, as you've always called your people, God, to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we would have no other God before you, that you would be preeminent and supreme in our hearts and minds and lives, in the way that we think and act and vote and live. So help us to hear your hard words this morning. Help us to have soft hearts. Help us to discover in your words the joy that is in them, the joy of obedience, the joy of exalting your name above every other name, the joy of the cross and of following you and of finding our lives in you. Help us in these few minutes. Thank you that you love us, you're for us, you're faithful and sovereign and good. Pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, the other night, a friend, a, couple, a young couple of friends of Kate and I had us over for dinner to their house. They've been doing uh, this outreach in another country to orphans, and they've established sort of an orphanage in this other country, and it's an awesome ministry that they're doing, and God is blessing it, and it's growing, and it's expanding, and they're purchasing land and all this stuff, all, you know, to love and serve these orphans. Uh, which is an awesome thing. But as is often the case with ministries as such, they are in need of funding. So while we usually go to this couple's house just to have dinner, we went to this couple's house to be asked to give money. No problem. That's okay. We, went, we knew what we were getting into. They told us that this is why we were going. And we went there, and you know how it goes. I mean, this is the way it ought to go. They, they told us the story of the orphanage and what's going on there, and then they showed us pictures. I know. And videos. You know, this is a region of the world where the the kids are beautiful. Kids are beautiful all over the world. But just beautiful, beautiful kids. Living in abject poverty or orphaned, obviously. Parents that have died of different things and kids that have suffered tremendously at the hands of bad people. In need of love and provision and care and all these things. He showed us the videos. You know, it's just tugging on our heartstrings, as it should. 
And so we finished dinner and we said, thank you very much. And we prayed for them that God would provide for the ministry. And, and then we got in the car and Kate said, well, how much should we give? 2000 or 3000 or more? First thing, we weren't even out of the driveway. Weren't even out of the driveway. 3000 I'm thinking, I don't know, a tenth as much? How much should we give? We weren't even out of the driveway. And the first thing is she was already committed to giving, which is good and beautiful. But you know, there's something about seeing those kids that really created a sense of compassion and care. And our text is birthed from that same thing in the heart of Jesus. Do you remember how chapter 9 ended? Chapter 9 ended with Jesus looking at the people and it says that he felt compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That word compassion means he felt in the very core of his being, in his guts. He felt for the people, us, the world, because of our plight. He felt real compassion. And you'll remember what he said to the disciples. He said, listen, the harvest is plentiful. There's lots of hurting people. There's lots of orphans. There's lots of those who are helpless and harassed. There's lots of needs in the world. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are the few, or few, excuse me. So he told them, pray the Lord of the harvest that he might send workers into his harvest field. That's what he told the disciples too. He just told them to pray, pray about it. He was pulling them into his compassion for the world his compassion for people, the way that he felt about the plight of humanity. He was pulling his disciples into it. And you know, the first step into that is prayer. Jesus just said, pray about it. Just pray about it. Pray about the tremendous needs in the world for the gospel and for ministry and mercy and all these things. Just pray about it and pray, oddly enough, that I would do something about it. That's what he said. Pray to me that I would send workers into the field. And then you know Jesus, sneaky, sneaky. You know what he did. No sooner did the guys pray for workers than they themselves became the workers. And it was funny, my friend, when we were at the dinner, he referenced that sermon that I gave about that to me. I said at the end, I said, Kate, let's pray for them what God would provide. He goes, well, remember your sermon, Brett. Were you taught that Jesus made the ones who were praying the only answer to their prayers? Remember that. Jeez, you got me. Okay. (laughs) But he did. Jesus saw the tremendous needs of the world, of the people, and he sent his disciples into the world in his name, in his power and authority to begin to meet the needs. They were sent. Wasn't only calling them to pray, he was calling them to step into and to lay hold of their sentness as the people of God. Their sentness as the people of God. And so he's been telling them in chapter 10, I want you to live intentionally. Remember, he's calling them to live intentionally. They were supposed to leave behind certain things and they were supposed to look for certain things. He was teaching them that he wanted them to be aware of open doors, you'll remember from last week. They were to be intentional now in the way that they were living. They were to be looking for open doors, opportunities, trying to discover through prayer and with the help of the Spirit what God was already up to in the place that they were. Intentionality, open doors. And he's also been telling them in this chapter, and we read it again today, in no uncertain terms, that mission always draws opposition. Mission always draws opposition. Now, this was kind of the first time that this was talked about with Jesus and toward his disciples and what would become the church. And history has proved, as it always does, that Jesus was right. Over 70 million Christians have been martyred for their faith in Jesus in the last 2,000 years. Jesus warned them, us, He said that this mission in his name, this work of the kingdom proclaiming and demonstrating who Christ is and what he does would draw great opposition. And so he told them in the text three times we read last week, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Three times is a biblical way of underlining, highlighting, bold, all caps. 
That's the biblical way of doing it. Because, you know, when the Bible was written, there was no underlining, highlighting, bold, all caps. From the beginning to end, the Bible repeats things three times that are of dire importance that we ought not to miss. That's why the Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Highlight, bold, underline, all caps. Three times he tells them, do not be afraid. Highlight, underline, bold, all caps. Why would he have to tell us that? Unless there would truly be scary opposition in the face of mission. Real threats. I mean, it wasn't that long after this, you know, that, that Christians were devoured in the Colosseums by lions as a sort of sport. All of the disciples, save one, would go on to be brutally martyred for their faith in Jesus. Don't be afraid. Because there was real opposition. And it was scary. And in our text today, it gets even scarier. When he says in verse 34, do not suppose that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And then he talks about family members that would be turning upon another. I mean, this is, this is gnarly stuff. Now we wonder about that statement because Jesus is told to us in the book of Isaiah to be the prince of peace. And when the angels announced the birth of Jesus, they said that there would be peace. Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy and peace to men on earth with whom he is well pleased. And we know that in the end, Isaiah the prophet told us, we will beat our weapons into plowshares and pruning hooks. There'll be no more death, no more destruction, no more war, no more violence. There will be, through Jesus, peace on earth. But this is given to us in the context of mission. Within the understanding that the coming of Jesus and his kingdom causes conflict in the world with the kingdom of darkness and even the kingdom of men. So in that way, in the way in which Jesus' message and work bring conflict and confrontation to darkness, there's a sword. The sword here is figurative language. This is not some holy war that we're called to. This is figurative language. The sword is a, is a picture of real conflict. You know what else the sword is a picture of in the Bible? The word of God, truth. And truth is like a sword and sword is like a truth. It confronts, it divides, it cuts to the core. Jesus is saying, I'm bringing something in my coming, in my kingdom, with my truth that will confront, that will divide, that will cut to the core so much that the reality would be, he said, that even fathers and sons, mothers and daughters would be turning against one another. Now, obviously, the understanding here is that in, at that time and in that culture and in our world today, when someone within a family unit would come to faith in Jesus Christ, the core declaration that is entailed in that, Jesus is Lord. In that context, it wasn't Caesar, it wasn't it was part of the Roman pantheon, it wasn't part of the Greek pantheon. Jesus is Lord. That that would cause conflict even in the closest relationships. Now we live in an individual sort of society. We are called radical Western individualists. And we mostly think about ourselves and what is good for us. The first century world wasn't like that. It was a communal, family-oriented world. And people didn't think, how will what I'm about to do serve me best or further my purposes or how will this be just for me? People didn't think that way. They thought, how will this affect my family? my primary community? How will this affect their will, their work, their legacy, their well-being? They didn't act as pure individuals as we often do. They acted as units at that time. So when someone walked into the home that would have been full of idols and false gods and different ideologies and allegiances and said, here's the deal. I was just baptized and now I pledge allegiance to Jesus. 
That would bring division, real conflict. And the exhortation that Jesus gives on the heels of that is nothing less than radical. Verse 37. He says, in light of that, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. Jesus is saying in stark terms that loyalty to him was to take precedence. Even over what was the the tightest unit at the time, the family. I mean, that's pretty clear, right? Right? He's saying loyalty to him was to take precedence. He's not asking us to be unloving toward or to reject our families in light of Jesus. Rather, he's helping us to know what to do in the hard, hard instances where our allegiance to Jesus is challenged by some other love. Be it good, right, bad, or whatever. He's telling us exactly what to do in those hard instances where allegiances clash. And that wasn't just a first century problem. It plays out in our own families in certain ways, though we are an individual-oriented culture. So often, you know, well, that's fine. You want to follow Jesus, that's fine. You know, there's lots of ways. Or if that works for you or whatever is good for you, we don't have the same sort of pressure. But there are still places in the world like many Muslim cultures and societies, where if Christ does what he's doing all around the world right now, reveal himself in a vision or a dream or some worker to a Muslim to be Jesus, the only unique son of God, the savior of the world, the name above all names, and they decide that they want to follow Jesus, this could mean death. If they go to dad and say, listen, I'm going to follow Jesus. I mean, this is a, a real situation in much of our world today. We read it and we're like, yeah, but I mean, what does he really mean? Other people in the world read it and they understand exactly what he means. I want us to think about those people for a moment because we think about ourselves enough and we'll get to ourselves in a minute. I want us to think about our brothers and sisters around the world for whom this is a real situation. You know, there are more Christians in the world. You don't see this in any news source. There are more Christians in the world being persecuted right now than any other time in history. There are 200 million Christians in the world living under persecution for whom this text really makes sense and feels really near to them, though it feels far from us. Do you know that more Christians in our world were martyred for their faith in Jesus in the last hundred years than in the previous 1900 combined? Persecution against Christians is worse and on a broader scale in our world than it's ever been. It's estimated that every three minutes a Christian dies for their faith in this world. Meaning about 170,000 Christians will die for their faith in the world this year. It is the most underrepresented, persecuted, maligned, tormented, killed, ostracized group of people in the world. And then I think about our vision as a church where we want to send missionaries to reach the unreached. You know, there's a reason why unreached places are still unreached. It's because they're hard places. Those are the hard places. So persecution seems really far off to us and the stats seem unbelievable because news agencies don't report it only when it's like kind of extreme, like the beheading of those Christians on the beach, then we hear it. But we don't hear about the every three minutes, 170,000. But it's gonna get real to us as a church as we endeavor to send people to these hard places where the gospel has never gone before. I mean, we're gonna send people to these kind of places. This is why we pray. It's why we have to pray. It's why we take this so seriously. This becomes real for us. But as a church, we're not, we're not to wait until, you know, it's one of our own that's persecuted overseas somewhere. We're kind of supposed to 
feel this all the time. Remember, the text started with Jesus and his compassion for people. I talked about Kate and I's compassion for those. We're supposed to feel about our persecuted brothers and sisters all the time. Hebrews 13, Pastor Sean referenced it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. That's the same sort of phrase that was used for Jesus' compassion for people. As if you felt their pain in your own bodies. That's hard for us to do. You know what? Honestly, I'm looking forward to going surfing after second service today. I'm looking forward to burrito. I'm going to go home to a comfortable house. The next day is going to be just as awesome. It's hard for me to feel that. I have to, I have to work to get myself there. The church has to work to get herself there. That's why in November, the church historically sets aside that whole month to think about and pray for the persecuted church. There's that slide again. International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. So remember how a few weeks ago we prayed right after the sermon, like we said, gosh, the text just said to pray. We got to pray. Let's obey that. I'm going to ask us to do something kind of weird now. I'm going to ask us to pray in the middle of the sermon. How's that sound? Okay, remember, we shouldn't feel weird about being asked to pray at church. Now, it's a, it's a little bit of work because it's hard to kind of feel the way the text is calling us to feel, but this is not so far. Some of the worst offenders in the world, countries that persecute Christians societally, culturally, or governmentally are countries that we hear about all the time. Here's a list of the top 10. These are the top 10 uh, countries that persecute. North Korea, Iraq, Eritrea, Afghanistan, which is misspelled there, God have mercy. Syria, Pakistan, Somalia, Sudan, Iran, Libya. We, we hear about these countries in the news all the time, right? North Korea just tested a nuclear missile. Syria, we hear about that all the time. Iraq, Iran. We don't hear normally about the persecution of Christians, but this is real. So we're going to take a few moments now and pray for them. We've done this for years as a church. And, and normally I provide prayer points, but I saw a video this week. It's only a minute long. And I'm going to show it to you in a moment. We're going to show a video that maybe challenges us to pray in a different way than we would generally think. So just watch this video. It's only a minute. I'll be right back. So, right, normally I would want to pray, Lord, just make the persecution stop. And that, that is a valid prayer, and we've prayed that a lot in the past as a church. But this video says, don't just pray for us, pray with us. If you pray for us, you'll pray the wrong things. You'll pray that it goes away. We're just asking you to pray that we would stand firm with the proclamation, Jesus is Lord. That intersects radically with our text in verse 32 where it says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. I mean, that's, that text is real to them. Like they read that text and they're saying, please pray for us that we be able to live into that text and not deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the face of these overwhelming threats. So there's lots of ways that we could also think to pray. Pray for the families that have been ripped apart. Pray for those who are bereaved because of persecution. You know what they do in Eritrea with Christians, that one country that was on there? They lock them in shipping containers in the hot African sun. You think of all sorts of ways to pray for those people. So I'm not trying to be sensationalist. I'm trying to feel what the text calls us to feel. That Hebrews 13 text, we'll put it up again. To sense a little bit of their pain. So 
Is this okay? We're going to just take a few minutes and pray right now. You know how people always, you talk to someone, they're like, oh, bro, I'll pray for you. You know they're not going to pray for you. When you pray in the moment, though, so if we just say in announcements, hey, pray for the persecuted church, we're not going to do it. But if we say, well, here we are, let's pray for the persecuted church now, then we can't escape. So if you're not a Christian and you're not here, you're welcome to pray with us, or you can just watch and trip out. You're welcome. We love you. Uh, if it's outside your comfort zone to pray with people, I totally understand that. I'm way outside my comfort zone right now. I get it. But when people are being persecuted around the world, it stops being about our comfort and starts being about something bigger, Right? So let's just pray for them a simple prayer. We'll just take like three minutes. Pray that they be able to stand firm. Turn to one another and start to pray, and then I'll be back. Thank you, God, for being the God who hears our prayers. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the one that intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and we don't know how to pray. And I, I, we would just confess that when faced with stuff like this, it seems so far away, but it's so near to us. This is our own family. It's hard sometimes to even know how to pray or how to fully feel this. So thank you for your grace with us and that you just call us to pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you're teaching us as your church to pray. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And we would be remiss, God, if we didn't thank you for the freedom we have in this country. We would be remiss. As Pastor Sean was saying earlier, it's a privilege that we can just come into this place and freely sing and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Thank you, God, for our freedoms. Pray these things together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good job, church. Good job. Okay, listen. Let's get back to thinking about what we like to think about most, ourselves. <laughs> How does the text apply to us? Just a few ways that it might apply to us, and then we'll, we'll let it be. Our experience is obviously very different, but the text still speaks to us. We probably, within our families, don't have to fear violent rejection, Probably not at gun or sword point or we be asking or being asked to deny the name of Jesus. But we are culturally in lots of ways being asked to deny the name of Jesus. In that passage where Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. That has a lot to do with us. Because you know, we in our culture, we love the approval of man. We love to be accepted. We don't want to be rejected. We're often fearful of rejection. So this is real to us in many ways. But there are all sorts of little ways in our lives where we can sort of deny or not acknowledge Jesus before others. That word acknowledge means to affirm, to agree with, to identify with. That touches all all the parts of our lives. I mean, th there's times where I find myself in the midst of an unrighteous conversation or context where I ought to say something on behalf of the righteous standard of God and I don't. Is that maybe in some way denying Christ in that moment? There are times where I see an open door for the gospel of Jesus that I ought to walk through and proclaim that Jesus is Lord to those who need to hear it, and I don't. Is that in somehow, some way denying Jesus? What does it look like to acknowledge, to affirm, to agree with, to identify with Jesus in this election year? When there's issues before us, like the foreigner, Immigration, like the unborn, abortion, like gender identity and access. What does it look like to acknowledge, to affirm, to agree with, to identify with Jesus in this election? Those are not easy questions. What does it look like to acknowledge, affirm, agree with, identify with Jesus in my own behavior? 
as it relates to forgiveness, alcohol, substances, lawlessness. You know, we probably, God have mercy, we probably will never have to be in the situation where we're asked to deny the name of Jesus at gunpoint. So the text is a little bit different for us. Since we don't have to do that, it doesn't mean that we get out from underneath the text. One of the challenges that we have, how do we then, how must we choose to acknowledge, affirm, agree with, identify with Jesus in this life, in this place, in our culture, with the things that we face? That's not easy, is it? We also need prayer. We also need prayer to stand firm in the face of temptation, opposition, evil, injustice. We also need prayer to stand firm. You know what also we need to remember? This truth encourages me. That in the end, Jesus will publicly affirm and identify himself with us, his church. That's a glorious thought. That's a glorious thought. And it, it helps me to think like, wait a minute. Why, why am I ever ashamed of Jesus? And that's what's happening when I don't speak up and I should or think more of my reputation or my ego or how I feel in that moment. Why, why would I ever be ashamed of Jesus? What is, if you strip away all the cultural junk, what is it about Jesus that there's worth being ashamed about? Nothing. What is there about me that's worth being ashamed about? A whole lot. And yet Jesus will publicly identify himself with his church when he comes on that day in glory. Helps me just to stand up and say, well, what an idiot I am. I'm not going to be ashamed of Jesus. I'm going to try to live out my identity in him. Verse 37 relates to us where he says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The idea here isn't new with Jesus. The idea is an old idea. You shall have no other God before me. It goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments. It is a call upon God, which he's always had upon his people, to love him supremely. Remember when Jesus was asked about the most important thing? Look at this text from Matthew. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. When I was a kid, I can remember doing that thing that kids do. Did you ever do this where you're, I don't know, you're, you're just old enough that you're trying to kind of locate yourself in the family and in the world, and so you ask silly questions. I remember I used to ask my mom, Mom, who in the world do you love most? Anybody ever ask those questions of their mom? You guys make me feel so alone. Thank you, little guy. God bless you. <laughs> little guy right here is about your age, bro. Thank you. The rest of you are lying old people. <clears throat> I remember asking that question. And obviously, obviously, it's a rhetorical question, right? The, the answer is supposed to be you, sweetheart. I love you the most. That's what we want to hear from mom or dad in that moment, right? We're trying to build security and we're trying to make sure that we're more loved than our little sisters, which was kind of a no-brainer, not that hard. <laughs> from a really, really deep place already as kids, we, we ask these sort of questions. And I can remember lying in my bed. I can remember my mom tucking me in and rubbing my forehead like this pushing my hair back, rubbing my forehead. And I remember asking her that question on many occasions. And she always said this, well, honey, I love Jesus the most. And then I love you guys, your sister, your daddy, but I love Jesus the most. Now, admittedly, that can be hard for a young one to sort of process but I'll tell you what that moment did for me. That moment laid a foundation of faith that years down the road when I saw this text, it made sense to me. 
It made sense to me because I never felt unloved by my mom. I never felt second best. I never felt like, well, she just loves Jesus, but I'm just nothing. I felt so radically loved and embraced by my mother. And yet when she then told me that she loved Jesus the most, you know what that did? That laid a foundation for exalting Jesus above everything else in my life. but the only person I've ever known that really lives this out. That had a radical, profound effect on me. Rightly putting God in his rightful place. So again, it's, it's not a command to unlove our family. We can love them beautifully. But Jesus is telling us what we need to hear. I'm better than any other person in your life. I'm more important than any other thing in your life. I am to be loved supremely in your life. And we know this isn't because Jesus is an egomaniac. This is because what has broken humanity is our proclivity to love other lesser things too much. It's called idolatry in the Bible. This breaks us. When we look for too much in lesser things, whether it's a a possession or whether it's a person like a spouse or children. You know, every other person and every other thing in this world will let you down except for Jesus. So when we have misplaced affections and loves and lesser things, we're bound to be brokenhearted. We're bound to be let down. Our hearts were formed and made by the breath and the word of God to love him supremely. And we are only ever whole and healed when we put Jesus in his rightful place. It's not telling us to love our families poorly. It's calling us to love him supremely. You see, we need prayer too. That can be hard to do. That can be challenging for us, as glorious as Jesus is. Verses 38 and 39, he says, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Their cross, excuse me, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. We get this. You know, we think that the way to happiness is getting whatever we want. That's what we generally think, right? Here's what I want, and if I get that, I'm happy. And as long as I'm always getting what I want, then I am more and more happy. Has anybody lived long enough to show that this isn't true? Has anybody lived long enough to experience a law of diminishing returns? Has anybody ever heard the phrase, be careful, you might just get what you want? Has anybody ever discovered that all that we want, anything that is less than Jesus, never satisfies and so Jesus says, look, if, you, if, you, if you're endeavoring to find your life in all these lesser things, you're going to lose it. How many people have lost their life in the pursuit of lesser things? But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it, he says. In other words, if we get lost in who Jesus is and salvation in him and his love for us, And truly, we have found life. It's what we were created for. And he, he, he says it this way. If anyone wants to follow me, they've got to pick up their cross. Now, his original audience, they, they knew what a cross was. To us, it's like jewelry or it's images that we put up in a building or something. Or we make it about these silly things. You know, oh, I have... I'm only thinking of really stupid examples. Uh... I've got hair on my back. That's my cross to bear. What, see, that was so stupid. I can't think of a good. Like, I can't think of a good example. But we think of these silly things that happen in our lives. Sometimes not so silly, real things, and we just say, "Well, that's that's my cross to bear." Listen, that's never what cross meant. Cross was a place where people died. That's only ever what it meant in the ears of the hearer. That's only ever what Jesus was referring to. Pick up your cross and follow me. Jesus was saying that in some way, a prerequisite for following him is death. He meant death to self, obviously. 
Because the kingdoms in conflict are not just the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. It is also the kingdom of God and the kingdom of self. And part of what it means to become a Christian is to make the proclamation, Jesus is Lord. And that means that we have to say, I am no longer Lord. It's where we get off the throne and put Jesus on the throne. Pick up our cross, deny ourselves. There's all sorts of minute little ways where that could play out in our lives with our wants and our desires and our will and there's dreams. But there's also sort of a a meta way, a big way in which that plays out. Scripture says it this way, you are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God. You are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God. A lot of life can just be lived in the freedom of God's common grace and in his will, and you just get to live and enjoy life. There are other times where your will is contrary to God's will. These are the Gethsemane moments. And our Lord has taught us to respond, not my will be done but your will be done. And then he went to the cross. That's what it is to take up our cross. Now think about your own life. Maybe it's a big way. Maybe you're not a Christian. You've been fighting God and you're here because he's been drawing you. And today is the day to die to self, so to speak, and say, God, I surrender. I know that I'm a sinner that needs forgiveness. Forgive me according to what you did on the cross. Maybe it's a smaller thing for you. Maybe it's a struggle with bitterness because of some of the circumstances of your life. Maybe it's something you're holding against another person. Maybe it's something that's got to hold on you. Step into that holy place of Gethsemane this morning where we come face to face with the cross where Jesus prayed three times that it would be different, but it wasn't. And he said, okay, Father, your will be done. And maybe you've prayed 300 times that it would be different and it isn't. Maybe it's time to say, Jesus, your will be done in this area. As I was thinking this week about the persecuted church and the freedom that we have in this country and my own will and my own sin and my desire for comfort. And I look at this text, I, I, I realize that in our culture, we, we, we kind of think that the worst thing that could possibly happen is suffering. So we've tried to build an entire culture on freedom for suffering, from suffering. And that's, that's not bad. Don't go looking for suffering. But the worst thing that can happen to a Christian is not suffering. The worst thing that happens in the life of a Christian is disobedience to Jesus our Lord. And I spend more of my time thinking about how I cannot suffer and be uncomfortable than I do thinking about how I can obey and be faithful. And this text is helping me by reminding me to take up my cross and follow him. Now, thankfully, because this has been such an uplifting, happy sermon, thankfully, suffering and persecution is not the whole of the story with mission. And the text has been about mission. It ends by saying this in verse 40. Jesus says, anyone who welcomes you, welcomes me. Anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's award, reward. Excuse me. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will not lose their reward. He says there, and by the way, mission will also be effective. People will receive you. In my name. And when they do so, they receive me and the one who sent me. You see how mission works? The Father sent the Son and the Son has sent us. Jesus came representing the Father. We go into the world representing Christ. We go as prophets and righteous people, so to speak. What did a prophet do? Prophets spoke the word of God, declared what was true. What does a righteous person do? They live out the will of God and show what is right. We go into the world as prophets and righteous people in Christ, declaring what is true and showing what is right. And it will draw opposition, but it will also be effective. 
Christ's kingdom is powerful. And there's power in the gospel. And the reward, he says, some people will, re, they will receive you and they will receive a reward. reward. The reward is that they will recognize Jesus as Lord and be brought into his blessing. That's what's happening in the kingdom. The kingdom is the extension of God's righteous rule and the bringing in to his gracious blessing. And as we go as prophets who talk about what is true and righteous people who live out what is right, then the world around us will look and be brought into the blessing of the extension of the kingdom, God's righteous rule. And God says, I'm always working on both ends. If you live life on mission and someone gives you a cold cup of water, I'll see that, I'll honor that, and I'll bless that. Why? It's never about us. God is always working on both ends. With those who are going and those who are receiving. So I need to hear that. That God's work is effective. And that I'm called to be a prophet and a righteous person. Declaring truth. Living out what is true. And I discover then that I need prayer too. So, we're going to finish by praying again. Oh my gosh, we're praying twice in church on a Sunday. Yes! You know what we're going to pray for? We're going to pray for ourselves. Because we need it. Because maybe we've seen little areas where we deny the Lord. Maybe we've seen places where we aren't picking up our cross, but we're asserting self. Maybe we're discouraged in declaring the truth and showing forth righteousness. And we need the same prayer that we prayed for the persecuted church, that we would be faithful to live out and declare Jesus is Lord in our place, in our context, in our lives, with our lives. Amen? So let's get in little groups. Pray for each other. Pray for yourselves. And then the worship team will come up and we'll be done.